Good morning. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to our gracious hosts for all that they've given in terms of putting this conference together. I'm here to talk a little bit today about some of the risks to finding prosperity and purpose in the fourth industrial revolution. And I want to say that it's been encouraging to see all the different references to the fourth industrial revolution in the conference so far. And I wanted to say thank you to Linton Wells yesterday because he did such a good job talking about the socioeconomic implications that I was actually inspired to go back uh, last night and change my presentation a bit to talk about something maybe a little bit further out there, which is to say, how is it that we're thinking about the world that may make a big difference in terms of being able to reach uh, prosperity and purpose in the fourth industrial revolution. So I will, quickly, I will quickly say a little bit about what the fourth industrial revolution is. And from the World Economic Forum's perspective, it is a set of emerging industrial technologies, first and foremost, which is to say uh, 3D printing, uh, neurotechnology, blockchain, all that are finding their way into the products and services that, uh, that are on offer today. It's a societal transformation, which is to say that it is how society is changing and transforming, predicated upon how technologies are reordering, reordering the substrates of our social relationships. It's a systemic change, because if we think about the systems of order, politics, technology, society, these have kind of been in a battle over the last several hundred years about which one takes precedence. And so technology, is pushing economy, the economy is uh, putting pressure on society, and so we're seeing how is it that that dynamic is changing. And the fourth industrial revolution, above all, is a mental model, right, or it's an umbrella concept, and it's an umbrella concept that takes in all of those kind of pillars, the, the government 4.0, the industry 4.0, uh, the societal uh, transformation that we just talked about, all of these kind of come underneath the, the big umbrella of the fourth industrial revolution. And one of the th ways that we look at it from the, from the World Economic Forum's perspective is to say that the fourth industrial revolution is a way in which we're working through our relationship with the technologies that are taking us into the future and trying to figure out how we're building our relationship with them. So quickly, when I said that I wanted to try something new, I said I would normally in this instance kind of give a, a kind of a detailed version or layering of what the fourth and four industrial revolutions look like. But let me kind of truncate that. Uh, and I'm gonna truncate that into what the step change is and then what the metaphor for being human is that is associated with it. And of course, for the engineers in the audience, uh, most of you know of James Watt and the rotary steam engine, right, and the power that, that it produced. Uh, so it's a step change in power, it's a step change in factory production, it's a step change in economic production, and the metaphor for the human being that's associated with this that we think of is the human as economic production unit, right, or laborer. And this is, I, ho I hope that this idea of the metaphor for the human being will come back full circle toward the end of this presentation and kind of help make sense of, of where I'm going with this. The second industrial revolution uh, is one that we think about predicated upon science. So scientific discovery, which provided new products, also scientific application of management processes. So if we think of Taylorism, right, in his text on scientific management, the whole idea was how do we create the assembly line, right, in a, in a scientific manner and get higher economic output or higher production output on the other end. So in this case, what we end up with is mass production and mass consumption, and the metaphor for the human being here is that of a consumer, one of the masses. With the third industrial revolution, it's a step change in information theory. It's a step change in the understanding of data storage control uh, and manipulation. And the introduction of the computer, which was built on the idea of how people at the time thought that human beings were going to, through their logical processes, has kind of inverted itself over time. So we built the computer thinking about human beings and, and logical processes, and over the, the third industrial revolution, we inverted that metaphor, and we began to think about human beings and the brain as a machine in and of itself. Right? And so the third industrial revolution, it can say that the, the metaphor for the human being here is that of a machine. And of course, the idea of a machine has been 
put onto everything else as well in terms of computing, whether it be you know, the, the cell as part of an organism, or the city, right, or an organization. And then we have the fourth industrial revolution. And there's something interesting about this picture. There's something in this picture that's not in the other three. Yeah, I heard it, a person, right? So there's, there's a person in this picture. And this is important, right? Because this is where the step change happens in the fourth industrial revolution is with the, conver the convergence of technologies, but the introduction of the embeddedness of the technologies into the human being and the human being into the loop with the technologies. Technologies are no longer just object over and against us, but they're something that is a part of us and it's a way in which we mediate our existence to ourselves. This has always been the case. It's just that it's much more obvious in the fourth industrial revolution. So in this case, the metaphor for the human being we can think of as hybrid, right? So machine, biological organism, or cyborg. But you know, the cyborg, the cyborg discussion, I think, uh, might go a bit too far. Uh, and so what is it that we're looking at when we're thinking about risk? So these four industrial revolutions, these four metaphors for being human, and then looking toward the future, and how might we think about where the risks would come from? Well, the future ain't what it used to be, right? This is a Yogi Berra quote. I love Yogi Berra quotes. There's, there's deep philosophy uh, in, his, in his version of, of baseball. Um, so the future is going to be quite different than the way that people thought about the future in the past. And one of the things, as an aside, I can just say this made me, this just reminded me right now, you know you're a bit behind when you go to your local mechanic to buy a product for your car and you realize the mechanic only takes cash, PayPal, and Bitcoin, right? Uh, this is a true story. This happened to me last week, and I thought, all right, I'm going to have to start updating some, updating some slides. Uh, so blockchain, right? Blockchain is an interesting technology because on the one hand, right, it creates secure, transparent, and anonymous. Uh, it's, it's, able to, to, it's able to have a ledger system for uh, secure, uh, transparent, and anonymous transactions. And that works just as well for good business as it does for consortia of child pornography rings. Right? So you have this kind of either or. There's risk, but there's also promise. CRISPR. Well, CRISPR is already providing benefits to geneticists and, um, and, to, phar and to pharmaceutical research. However, the fact that it's the fact that it is uh, easier and more robust to do allows for a greater potential for biohacking, right, or the potential for the creation of bioweapons. If we look at neurotechnologies, neurotechnologies are coming along at a rapid pace. It's one of those, it's one of those I would say, it's one of the most underestimated technologies of the fourth industrial revolution in terms of its speed uh, of development. And we have the potential here to unlock some of the longest held mysteries uh, of science and kind of human folklore and religion and at the same time we have the opportunity to undermine human agency and compromise human agency in ways that we may not even be able to quite yet imagine. And we have a future where the actual planet uh, is in a kind of state of peril or a state of risk which wasn't always the case. When you think about the first and second industrial revolution, these were times when people thought about the future as this kind of wide open frontier and expanse that was out there for the taking and for development. And now we're realizing that we're developing into an industrial revolution where we have, where we have constraints and that the technologies are impacting the environment around us. And while we might, have, we might have advances in clean energy coming along, those advancements have a downside, which is that they could create geopolitical risk Right, from, the, from the nation states and from the companies, et cetera, and the influence of those that are already invested in older energy products. So, risks and benefit. But are those the right questions, right? Here's, which one is it? Is this good or bad? You have, you have exploitation or you have empowerment. And what I want to do is I want to say, let's move away from those things, the benefits and the risks, and let's look at what's visible, right? The components, the objects, or events. This is where people generally want to focus. What are the technologies? Which technology will do X? Which technology will do Y? What will technology do to us? And what I want to do is take just a moment and say, let's look at, let's look at some of the things that are invisible. Right. So experience, process, relationships, meaning. 
And so if I were to think about it, if I were to do this in a very simplistic way, you know, I might say, well, what is, uh, what is a cookie, right? A cookie, is it the actual physical cookie? Is it the recipe of the cookie and all the bits, right, the composition? Is it the process of making the cookie, right, on the other side? Is it what the cookie means to you, right, when you eat it? Right? A cookie is not a cookie to a rock, right? It's only a cookie to somebody who eats cookies, right? And in this way, technology kind of functions like this. There's, it's an object. It does a certain thing. It's developed through a certain process, but it has a certain meaning. And while the object itself is not neutral, it's all of the things in the, in the left-hand column that are actuators for how the technology is used and changes and transforms society over time. And I think one of the most important things on here to focus on is meaning, because it's meaning that tells us who we are through the technology that we create, and it tells us a little bit about what the world is for. Um, and we realize, human beings realize meaning through technology, through processes, by using them to create the project, the projects that determine the future. And so what are some of the risks associated with this in terms of thinking about meaning, thinking about something that's, that's intangible? Well, these are things that have to be made visible. And that is the slow transformation of physical and imagined communities you know, could exchange one format of societal cohesiveness for a potentially more fragile one. I think we're seeing a little bit of that and we'll talk more about that on the, on the next slide. That's the first risk that I want to identify. The second risk that I would like to identify is that mismanaged incentive structures could lead to a split between our vision of the future, the future that we think will be out there, and the actual future that we produce, right? the one that comes about through the processes that we have in place. And of course, the components and social outcomes are a part of that. And the third risk that I'd like to identify is that there's a shift in the means of production, or there has been a shift in the means of production to specialized technology, right, to, the, to data, right, which can reduce inclusivity, can reduce diversity and stability, and exacerbate what I would call social class extrusion and bifurcation. And by that, that means if any of you have seen the um, if any of you have seen the, the you know the Frey and Osborne work where you talk about the, the disappearing middle, right, and the pushing pushing people apart into the kind of high class, low class. Uh, separation. And you kind of think it's very hard to put those things back together. Once a group of bicycles, you know, in the Tour de France, once one group pulls completely away from that second group and you get the air gap, it's hard, it's hard to catch up. So, you know, how is it that the shift in the means of production is, is doing this? And so, to the first point, restructuring of communities. Uh, some of you may know Robert Putnam's uh, best-selling book, right, Bowling Alone, right? And of course, the thesis of Bowling Alone is that, at least in the United States, uh, democracy is in jeopardy, right? The risk, the thing that is in jeopardy that has value is the democratic process, uh, and it's because social participation is being lowered. And how, why is social participation being lowered? Well, he tracks it down to uh, the impact of technology and technological systems. In the second case here, we have Tinder. And I know there's probably somebody in here swiping right now, right? Somewhere, somewhere in the back. It's you. Um, you know, Tinder's Singapore's number one dating app, um, by the way. At least I read this. I read this not too long ago. Uh, the, interesting thing about, the interesting thing about Tinder is what it does is it changes these social relationships once again in a different way. It's not just that technology impacts or reduces uh, civic participation. But technology changes the way that we look at one another, right? Other people are objects or resources at hand, right, rather than individual human beings in a certain way. So there's a reduction perspective there. There's also a positive perspective there, which is to say that it provides me with information about how other people see me, or at least see the, the kind of projection of me that I want to put onto uh, the platform. Right? So there's something going on in this case where the rapidity and the volume of people with, wh with whom you can interact is very, very different than the way it used to be. And it's created new social behaviors, right? So in the dating community, they might say, oh, you know, someone's ghosting, which means that they, they, they've found you on Tinder, they met you, and then boom, they just disappear and they don't ever talk to you or see you or return your text. Or they flake out at the last minute because something better comes up. And these types of behaviors are things that you can see uh, once again, you know, the, the uptick in this kind of discussion online, especially about uh, these types of 
these types of applications that create new forms of social interaction. If we take the one thing about Tinder, which we could say, is that at least Tinder provides you with all of the people that are within a particular environment, right, within a particular um, radius of the user. If we look at Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica's claims for what they did with the, what they did with the US election, right, for the, and for the Trump team, what they're talking about there is psychographic segmentation rather than just basic data analytic or you know, market segmentation that follows you know, your particular likes or dislikes, et cetera, but more in the times of what kind of mood are you in, uh, what kind of disposition do you have, how can I provide you with the same kind of product I would provide somebody else with a different disposition, but I just have to know which images you would like that will make you buy the product and I would give different images to a different person. So this type of, this type of extreme segmentation and so these types of things are quite interesting because they could be more, they could be, they allow us a kind of wider capacity to engage. So if I'm somebody who really doesn't fit into my community, I might find somebody who's not in my community who's like me with whom I can engage. But then I might also say, well, I haven't learned those lessons of wisdom and compassion and showing up on time and respect for other people, et cetera, in a way in which they're traditionally understood. And so it's really a transformative, uh, transformative social enterprise. If I look at the second point, which is if mismanaged incentives can lead to a disjuncture between the, the, the future, the vision of the future and the actual production of the future, uh, I also like this Yogi Berra quote, right? You have to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. This is the 1960s vision of the future, right? And the 1960s vision of the future, I can't think of another decade in the last 150 years that was more obsessed with technology in the future than this one, than the 1960s. And this 1960s is the era of atomic energy, um, biotechnology um, breakthroughs. Uh, it's the era of cyber, cybernetics, right? Norbert Wiener and cybernetics, uh, AI, right? So, so everyone was kind of expecting that the future would end up like this. 2001, we, our space station is not quite so grand, but at least there is one. Um, the Jetsons, right, you have the flying cars, but again, what's the interesting thing about the Jetsons, you have Rosie the robot, right, the Roomba, I saw the Roomba several times, or at least discussions, uh, or, or references to it yesterday, uh, and that's about as far as we've gotten towards Rosie the robot, but technology was still looked at as objects in the, in the 1960s, as these things, rather than something that was inside of you, except through the science fiction. And so if you look at something like Planet of the Apes, or if you look at something like the, 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 the Marvel comics of the 1960s, that's where you get the Hulk and Spider-Man, right? Where, you, where, where the, they've, been, they've been infected by technology in some way. But this is this vision of the future from the 1960s. This is the future, right, after the 1960s, right? So this is, this is what the future produced. Now why did the future produce this instead of producing the other things? Right, well the future produced this because for those technologies that are social, mobile, analytic, cloud computers, right, the SMAC, right, the technologies that we talked about, you know, for several years ago, you have economic incentives, you have large markets, low barriers to entry, uh, speed of return on investment, right, all of those things that you would learn in any MBA class, right, which would be positive for, for building uh, a market and a set of products. Why don't we have uh, the, this morning, the, the, the presentation, the discussion of the new pharmaceuticals, why haven't we cured every disease? Intellectual property, high barriers to entry, long window for return on investment, right? All of those, once again, the way that the system is set up for business is excluding the advancement of some technologies and kind of empowering, or I guess you'd say, uh, kind of catalyzing the production of other forms of technologies. Right? So, the incentive structures that are behind the production of the future are something else that's not always visible, but then we see the manifestation of it down the road. So this is another consequence, right, that has taken time to go through. Let me look at this. So for accessibility and purpose, I love the do-it-yourself VR from Google, the, car, the, the, the Google Cardboard. Google Cardboard is implicit evidence that there is social division in technology. Social division in technologies has existed forever in ancient Greece. The, 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 the richest people had the, best, uh, had the best equipment for the battlefield. Right? This has always been the case. Uh, 
However, they were leading on the battlefield rather than, rather than sitting in the back. But the, the issue is that by putting this out there, Google is saying, we recognize that technology at the, first, at the beginning, at least in the way that it's produced in the system that we have now, is for those that have. Right? And I think Victor mentioned this uh, yesterday in his, in his presentation. Right? It's much easier to continue to stay on top if you already have a head start. And so these are some of the technologies that are continuing to be produced. Over here we have, uh, over here we have genetically engineered mice. Here we have bones where stem cells from your very own stem cells are going to grow your very own bones. Right? Uh, here we have, down here in the bottom left, we have meat. Uh, that's being produced, and on the bottom right we have transgenic chickens, so that you know they don't grow feathers because that way it's easier to kill them and package them without having to defeather them, right? And in each one of these, what we have is an embedded set of values, right, from that system, right? The means of production have shifted. You have you have uh, new technologies that have values in them that may increase. Uh, exclusivity, they may, in, they may decrease diversity, et cetera. And one of the things that's happening here is we're finding that for jobs, in order to be a part of the economy that is able to be, and be a rewarded economic production unit, you have to have more and more specialized skills to participate in an economy that's producing and is going to produce these types of products because you're going to need the, uh, you're going to need the, the academic and the management skills to do so. So what I want to say here is that if we think back at the very beginning, when I was saying, like, think about the metaphors for being a human being, what we're doing is we're building a world that is in line with the metaphors of how we think about being a human being. We're building a world for hybrid cyborg consumer laborers. And if you're not a good hybrid cyborg consumer laborer, meaning being able to take advantage of the technology, the AI to enhance you and your cognitive skills, right, to be a part of that future, it's going to be hard to have a place. So if you think about another example of how we've been doing this, if we look at somebody mentioned, I saw there's, someone had put a picture of the Terminator up yesterday. Um, <laughs> There's always a picture of the Terminator, but the Terminator's awesome, and there's a reason the Terminator's awesome. If you look at the history of the Terminator, in 1982 or 3 when it came out, uh, the first film, it was the apocalypse. Technology was the apocalypse. AI, robots, it was the apocalypse. The, tech, the, the, the words were literally, it will not stop, it'll kill you, right? And it, and it won't stop until it does. Ten years later, after a decade of living with computers in our houses, we had a good Terminator. <laughs> and a bad Terminator, right, in the same film. And we had to decide which one that we trusted and which one we didn't, right? By the time you get to the last Terminator, you have a Terminator that thinks it's a human because it's a cyborg. It has a human heart. It donates its heart to save the life of a real human who hates the machines, right? It's a lot more confusing. And so art, in this way, the metaphors for how and the trajectory of our world are changing. And what I'm trying to do with this presentation, the reason that I changed it, you know, thanks to, uh, thanks to Linton, so I really appreciate his, I really appreciate, uh, his presentation, is that, is that I want to say, like, it's a lot more to it. How we think about the world is a lot more important, even though it's invisible, than perhaps even the technologies themselves or the numbers we attribute to them, right? The way that we construct a metaphor for what world we want to build and why it's important and what it's for is key. And so how, what do we do if we know this, right? if we take this as true? Well, let's future-proof, let's create some future-proofing principles in the same way that people create future-proofing principles for themselves. Instead of thinking about future-proofing like let's predict the future and then do something to stop or uh, to mitigate what might happen in the future, Think about how human beings have dealt with all of us having had radically uncertain futures our entire lives. We don't know if we're going to go outside and get hit by a bus, right? We, we don't know what the future is going to be. So people do it with principles. We say, honesty is the best policy. Treat others as you would like to be treated, right? You know, this, if I follow these rules, things will most likely be all right no matter what future I encounter. If I remember that most decisions made after midnight are bad ones, right, I might 
I might get through life, right, in, in, a, in a good way. So what kind of principles can we remember? Well, think about the systems, right? Not just the technologies. Think about all of those lateral issues. Think about the invisible issues. Empowering, right, not determining. Think about how it is that technology can empower people rather than be deterministic in their lives. Give them choice and opportunity. Think about a future by design, right, and not by default. Don't end up as, you know, the, the previous one with the Jetsons and, the, and the, the mobile phones, right? That was just a little take off of Peter Thiel's we wanted flying cars, but we got 140 characters, right? So this is, think about what we want for the future. No, no designed economy has ever worked, right, exactly the way that, exactly in that way. But, it, but if we don't have a goal, right, we might not get there. And then also to think about values as a feature and not a bug, to have a values-based approach. And that is to say, from the World Economic Forum's perspective, the forum is a neutral platform upon, within which everyone can engage, but it still has a normative framework, which is to say, we want to, include, we want to improve the state of the world and exclude bad actors. Right? So um, values as a feature. And of course, I don't think we have time here to go too deeply into the different types of values-based approaches, but some from the forum have already been working on these different, uh, different uh, councils that the forum uh, puts together in its, from its expert network. And the new social uh, covenant on values has identified three kind of overarching global values across cultures. And so I appreciated uh, May Ann's comments about values being different in different parts of the world depending on culture. But here are three that seem to be at least kind of broad parameter setting values. You know, preservation of the dignity of the human person, the importance of the common good that transcends individual interest, and the need for stewardship, and especially for the environment that's not just for us, but for, for posterity. And that's something that most cultures, right, and most nations seem to be able to get, get on with. And so the idea is how do you have conversations throughout the technological development process that encourages these values and always places the technologies up to, uh, up to, uh, those, up to those standards. And so what do we need? We need technology leadership, of course. We need leadership in terms of governance, which was mentioned several times yesterday, and of course this morning with, uh, you know, with, with the um, Interpol presentation. We need uh, values leadership in organizations, and we need systems leadership, leaders that can see how these things connect to all the other systems. And of course, we have to remember purpose. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah.